So just a couple of uh, other announcements real quick. We are looking for more people to help us do filming of our announcements. So <laughs> and that way you get your opportunity to be there for the bloopers. Um, there is a membership class coming up. It's starting January 6th, which is a Sunday. We are going to do membership on Sunday uh, at 10 o'clock between our services because some people can't make it out for a Saturday. Uh, it'll just be a little bit longer. It'll be like five weeks, I think. Um, Carl, if you remember, five weeks. Yeah. Uh, so, um, anyways, if you're interested in that, there's a sign-up sheet on the registration table, and uh, we'll get you plugged right into that class that's coming up January 6th at 10 o'clock. So, um, so there was this uh, young guy, uh, married guy, and um, back in uh, Arkansas, and you know, back in the in the in the, in the hills, and um, his wife was expecting, and you know, they lived in really uh, meager uh, conditions, and. They didn't have electricity or anything like that, but the local doctor went there anyway because she was due to give birth, and the doctor knew that the guy was really nervous and said, I just could give this guy something to do to keep his mind off the stuff, so he says, here, he goes, you hold the lantern right here. He goes, you got to hold the lantern here so I can see what I'm doing, and he goes, because here comes your first baby, and this baby's born. He goes, congratulations, you know, you're a dad. He goes, oh, wait, keep the lantern right there. He goes, there's something else happening here, and and another baby came. He goes, you got, you got two babies. And he said, now, wait a minute. Keep the lantern. You got to hold the lantern right there. He goes, there's something else happening. And, and here comes another baby. And finally, the guy says, gee, I don't know, Doc. You think it's the light that's attracting him? <laughs> so we, uh, we, have, uh, we have a light given us. And I was thinking, like, you know, what better message to kind of end 2018 and go into 2019 than to talk about the power and the authority of the Word of God. And I want to start off by looking at a scripture that Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. He says, you, however, continue in the things you have learned. And I just want to stop right there. Paul's telling Timothy, saying, listen, Timothy is a young pastor at this point, by the way, and, and Paul is seasoned. He's been around the sun a few times. And he's like, Timothy, um, I want to remind you that, you know, as a, uh, as a kid growing up, you learned something in your home. You learned something in your home. And he goes on and he says, and have become convinced of. Not only did you learn something, but you became convinced of something. The things that you learned became convictions in your life. Now that's huge, because you've got to learn something before it becomes a conviction. You can't just pull convictions out of the air and have baseless facts. He says you learned something, you became convicted of those things, knowing from whom you have learned them, and from childhood you have known the sacred writings. And so this is so important because he's saying, Timothy, you have convictions that you are now living your life by and governing your life by, the sacred writings, and you learned them at childhood. It's so important that we teach children the Word of God um, because what they learn as kids becomes the platform for how they view life. And they need a biblical worldview because if they don't get a solid biblical worldview, by the time they get into public school or even into higher education, they are going to be bombarded with a secular atheistic worldview. I mean, that's almost like that's the design and the desire of education today is to feed people with secular concepts because of the whole separation of church and state. We've divorced uh, education from the Bible. You know, it's interesting because in my library, I have a first grade primer from the uh, Revolutionary War periods. And guess what? That entire thing is based on the scriptures. They learned how to count by the Ten Commandments, and they learned all these different, I mean, literally everything is based on the scriptures. And so he's saying, you learn these things about the sacred writings. And then he says, really, what it's for. And he says, because in it is the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. And so this is the whole purpose of the Word of God, is that the Word of God is a revelation that gives us wisdom on how we obtain salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. That's, that's really what this is all about. Now, there's, there's a whole lot more in here, and there's a whole lot more for us, but the primary goal of the Scriptures is to give us that understanding that there is salvation in no other name but the name Jesus Christ. And so uh, Paul is, is reminding Timothy of these things, and then he goes on into verse 16, and he says, all Scripture, 
all, all scripture is inspired of God and it is profitable. Now let me just stop right there because that word profit is a huge word, right? Profit means gain. Profit means forward momentum. Profit means something is being added to your life. And he says all scripture is given by inspiration and it is profitable. There's a benefit that's coming into our life. And then he goes on, he's saying it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. And so as Paul is teaching Timothy here the importance of the scriptures, he's saying you learned these as a kid, so important, a big responsibility, whether parents or grandparents that were always inculculating the word of God into the lives of our kids, and, uh, and he says, and through that comes the knowledge of salvation uh, by faith in Jesus Christ. And then he says, all scripture is given by inspiration or is inspired by God. And so one of the first things we're going to look at is that word inspired. That word inspired literally means God breathed. That a lot of times you will hear the argument, oh, you believe in things that you get from a book that was written by men. Which is hilarious because that usually comes from college students who are learning things from books written by men, right? Uh, I'm so, but, but we say, well, wait a minute, back up a little bit. This is written by men, but not from the heart or the mind of man. It came inspired, and that word means God breathed, that God breathed on men and influenced their conscience to write. With, they didn't just wake up one day and say, hey, you know, I think I'll write some scripture today. God breathed on them and burdened them with a message that they wrote and it was recorded and then at one point of time compiled into the scriptures as we know it now. And so we have this, this God-breathed book that, that we say contains the revelation of God, contains the mind of God. And there should be proofs of that, right? Listen, we never just base our faith on aimless you know, ideas or concepts. We're not taking a leap into nothing we have evidences, right? Faith is based in evidences. It's not just blind faith. You know, people say, you, you just believe something. No, we don't just believe something. We have evidences. So are there evidences? Well, first of all, the scripture says this. Jesus is speaking, and Jesus says in John 16, 13, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. So it's the Spirit of God that moved on the hearts of these writers. It's the Spirit of God, which, by the way, in Hebrew, the word rach, which means breath, is also the same as spirit. So God breathed on them. Inspired means the breath of God. God breathed, God inspired, the Holy Spirit moved on people, and they wrote these scriptures, which is truth. He says the Spirit of truth. One of the names of the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. Truth. The word of God is called truth. In John 17, Jesus said, Father, sanctify them through the truth. Your word is truth. Which is interesting because Jesus said, I am the way, the life, and the truth. So you get this, this, this glue that holds everything together. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, word of God. All being true. A revelation of truth from God. So are there proofs? Are there things? If this thing literally is the revelation from God Almighty to us humans then there should be some things that we would expect to find out about this book, right? So let's go through a number of them as we're talking about the inspiration. Number one, it should be 100% accurate. The Bible should be 100% accurate. Um, and let me just give for an evidence of the Bible being 100% accurate that no other manuscript has had 2,000 years of intense scrutiny by atheists, by critics, by skeptics, by people who wanted to prove that it wasn't true. For 2,000 years, people have tried to prove it not true and have totally and miserably failed, right? So that's one of the evidences that we know. Not only that, but we know that Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. It's going to stand the test of time. Whether the Lord delays his second coming for another 2,000 years, okay, science, archaeology, none of this stuff is ever going to disprove the Bible. As a matter of fact, 2,000 years of archaeology 
has never disproven any of the historical um, truths that the Bible has presented, but instead has actually enhanced and proven things. You know, the Bible said there was an ancient civilization here. Archaeologists dig and dig and dig, and guess what they find out? There was an ancient, just recently they just discovered a city that was run by the Hittites. And for a lot of years, people never believed that there was actually a people called the Hittites. But the Bible said there was a group of people called the Hittites. And just recently, they unearthed an entire city that was you know, uh, uh, occupied by these people called the Hittites. And so archaeology has always proven the 100% accuracy of the Word of God. Um, the second thing is, is that there should not be any contradictions, which again kind of goes into the 100% accuracy, um, but there shouldn't be contradictions in the Word of God. And a lot of times people say, oh, you know, there's contradictions. And, and they think that they found contradictions, but when you get into it and when you really dig into the, the historical background or things like that, you find out that they're not contradictions at all. And a lot of these contradictions come from people who get into the date lines, the timelines. This king ruled in Judah. This king ruled in Israel. This was happening in, in Persia. And they say, oh, you know, there's contradictions. But when you actually get into it, there are no contradictions. One of the contradictions is, is that um, Mount Sinai has never been discovered. You know, um, they, they've gone all over the Sinai Peninsula, and Mount Sinai has never been discovered. And here it is, this mountain that Moses went up to receive the Ten Commandments, and there should be all kinds of evidences and proofs, but they've never found it. Well, I've got this DVD here called the In Search of the Real Sinai. As a matter of fact, Steve Travis is going to be showing this on one of his movie nights, hopefully really soon. You're not going to want to miss this, because these guys went back to the Bible, and guess what they found in the Bible? They found that in Galatians, it says Mount Sinai, which is in... Saudi Arabia. The Bible tells us that it's not in the Sinai Peninsula, it's actually in Saudi Arabia. And so they actually illegally break in and find Mount Musa, which, which is called by the Muslims Mount Musa, which is the mountain of Moses. And the evidences that they find on this thing will blow you away. Absolutely blow your mind. So when Steve shows this, I know you're going to have a good uh, crowd when you show this one because it's really powerful. So, um, so that's uh, in search of the real Mount Sinai. So all of these contradictions that people think are there really aren't there. Paul says this in 2 Timothy 2.15, Be diligent to present yourself approved of God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Some translation says actually dividing. A lot of times people say there's contradictions because they don't know the division between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And, uh, and, and not that there's contradictions there, it's just that the New Testament completes the Old Testament. The Old Testament reveals, uh, or, or you know, is the, the Old Testament is like the, the, the stalk and then the New Testament is the flower, the bloom of the gospel of Christ. It's all one revelation, um, but people don't read it either in a historical perspective or a cultural perspective, and they might say, well, there's contradictions in there because they don't understand those things, but there actually are no contradictions. So 100% accuracy, no contradictions. Um, we should also find, if this is really a revelation from God himself, we should find that it contains a fundamental message throughout. Uh, in other words, we know that this is like a library of different books written over quite a span of time. Um, but if it's God's word, there really should be a theme that runs throughout the whole thing. And we find out that that's exactly what we find. We find out that this Bible really is about one thing. It's a revelation of the fall and the redemption of humanity. It's a revelation that man is not now what he was created to be. He has fallen in a, a, a sinful state, and God has made a way of redeeming, of salvation, of, of forgiving, of causing to become righteous. And that is the story. This, isn't, you know, this contains a lot of accurate history, but it doesn't claim to be a history book. This claims a lot of, this, this has a lot of scientific evidences in it, but it doesn't claim to be a science book. It claims to only be one thing, the revelation of the fall of man in a, in a fallen condition and the restoration through Jesus Christ at their salvation in his name. And so it definitely contains a fundamental message that runs throughout the entire scope of the scriptures. What else would we find? We would find that it addresses all people 
in all times. I mean, if this is a revelation of God to humanity, then it should speak to the human condition and the human heart, regardless of what time period they lived in, or regardless of what social status they lived in, or regardless of what geography they lived in. This should speak to humans no matter where they are. And what do we find? We find that that's exactly the truth. That whether they're a CEO from you know, New York or Los Angeles and wearing $1,000 suits, or whether they're aborigines living in the jungle, this speaks to the human condition of mankind, no matter who, where, or what. Whether they're highly educated, or whether they're illiterate, whether they're extremely wealthy, or they live in poverty, it doesn't matter. This has a message that speaks to absolutely everybody, all people, in all places, at all times. Paul says this, in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, he says, For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. What's he saying there? He's saying is that it doesn't matter where people are, who people are, what people are, when they receive the instructions from the scriptures, that, that, that which can make them wise unto salvation, it works and causes people to become saved, no matter where they are. Um, and so this tells us that, that this is um, something that is addressing all people, all times, in all places. It's not the word of man, it is literally the Word of God. It's a revelation of God. If it is a revelation of God, what else should we look for? What else should we expect to find? Well, we would expect to find that it's addressing man's relationship with God. That that's really what it's about. It's not talking about Greek mythology and what's happening behind the scenes with all the gods and goddesses or Roman mythology. And all. You know, it's talking about a relationship with God and how do we have that relationship. And that is really the theme of of the scriptures. I mean, you can find certain scriptures like Romans 6, 23 that really hit the nail on the head for the wages of sin is death. The free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's talking about the condition of a relationship with God, how we can have a relationship with God. That yes, you know, we're fallen in sin and sin equals death and we're all going to die. And, but we don't have to die the second death, separation from God. There's a gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Something else we would expect to find is that it would contain a standard of morality reflect, uh, reflecting the holiness of God. If this is God's revelation, then it should tell us who God is, right? So when we look at Greek mythology, when we look at Roman mythology, and when we look at the gods and the goddesses and the, uh, you know, the, the plethora of all these different gods out there, what do we find? We find very humanistic characters. We find gods that commit adultery, we find gods that commit incest, we find gods that are wrathful, we find gods that are revengeful, we find all of these things because they're from the heart of man, so they reflect the condition of man. But this is from, if this is from the heart of God, we would find something that would reflect the condition and the holiness of God. And what do we find? Well, one of the first things we find are the Ten Commandments, standards that are so high that we can't keep them. What kind, of person would we, what kind of person would create a religion that we couldn't keep? You see, every little religion is based on works, things we can do. In Islam, you have the five circles, and you have the prayer, and you have all this kind of crazy stuff you have to do, but it's something people can work through. Here we have standards that we can't keep. Why? Because it's reflecting the holiness of God and our unholiness at the same time. And so we find it exactly as the, as the revelation in the scriptures would claim to be, a morality that, that, that reflects the holiness of God, that God is pure, that God is holy, and aren't we glad that God is pure and God is holy and there's no shifting of shadows with God? What else would we find? We would find a revelation of who God is. If this is from God, then there should be a revelation in here of of what God's like and who's God, who God is. And what do we find in here? We find these things called attributes. Things that God reveals about himself that we attribute to his nature. So we find out that God is holy. We find out that God is eternal. We find out that God is all-powerful. We find out that God is all-knowing. We find out that God is righteous and God is just and God is long-suffering. All of these things. What else do we find out? We find out that God has multiple names. 
that he is the great I am. He's El Elyon. He's the El Shaddai. He's Jehovah. He's Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals. He's Jehovah Nisi, the God your banner. He's Jehovah Sidkenu, the God of your righteousness. All of these things. He's Jesus, which means Savior, Deliverer. Uh, so we find all of these revelations of who God is through the names of God, through the attributes of God in the scriptures. Like people say, well, I don't need church, I don't need the Bible, because I just go out in nature, and I, I find God in nature. No, you know what you do find in nature? You find a lot of violence. Nature reveals a lot of violence, doesn't it? The little, nice, sweet little mouse, right, that gets eaten by the fox. The little, nice, fuzzy fox that gets eaten by the coyote. The coyote that gets eaten by the bear, right? You just find a lot of horrible things that's happened out in nature. You know, and, and, and do you find... Is there a revelation of God in nature? Absolutely, because God is the God of creation. And nature reflects God's creation and God's diversity. Incredible revelation of God there. But the highest revelation of God is in the scriptures and especially in the person of Jesus Christ, who again is revealed to us through the scriptures. Um, and, that's, and that's how we understand this revelation of God. What else would we, if this is really God's book, what else would we expect to find? We would expect to find that um, it contains a prophetic nature because only God knows the future. And so if God is God and he's all-knowing and he's timeless, he's eternal, he doesn't go through time in a linear fashion like you and I, he literally encompasses time, we would find a God that would be able to know the future. Do we find that? Oh my goodness. Hundreds of years before Jesus is born, the prophet says a virgin will give birth. Holy smokes, what a, what a prophetic stamp of approval was that, right? Hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus, the Savior will come from Bethlehem. Wow, Mary and Joseph weren't, weren't even living in Bethlehem, but what happens? God moves the hand of the entire Roman nation. They decide to, they, they decide to take a census and a taxation, and everybody's go back to their hometown, and boom, off they go to Bethlehem just so that Jesus could fulfill a prophetic scripture. 300 prophetic scriptures just on the birth of Jesus alone. Is there a prophetic element? Thousands of years. David writes in Psalm 22, the crucifixion psalm, my hands, my feet will be pierced. That didn't happen for hundreds of years later when the Romans invented this brutal form of execution called crucifixion, where you were nailed to a cross in your hands and feet. Isaiah 53, talking about the servant that would suffer and that God would crush him. All prophetic. God knows the future. So in here we find an element of future events. When Daniel talks about the beasts and, and, and you know, he talks about uh, the statue of gold and he talks about these different beasts and they all refer to the coming kingdoms. Like, oh, what do you mean? The, the, you, you have the Babylonian kingdom and they rule the entire world. There were going to be other kingdoms. Oh, yeah, after that was going to come the, the Persians and then after the Persians were going to come the Greeks and after the Greeks were going to come the Romans. All foretold thousands of years before they actually happened, hundreds of years before they actually happened. Um, and then, of course, you got the book of Revelation, which is all about end time events, which is, you know, kind of heebie jeebie creepy out there because there's all kinds of stuff happening in that that, that we think, you know, is, and we try to piece it all together and we usually miss it by a country mile. But, anyways, it happens anyway. What else would we find? If this is really a revelation of God, if this is really God's word, what else would we find? Well, we'd find that it would be confirmed by the miraculous. There would be a confirmation of supernatural activities because God is a supernatural God. And we find in Mark chapter 16, for instance, it says they went out and preached everywhere. The Lord worked with them, confirming the word, not confirming the apostles, not confirming their ministry, not confirming how cool they are, but confirming his word with signs and wonders. And then we have um, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 4, God also testifying with them both by signs and wonders and various miracles and the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So there was a ton of supernatural and that supernatural, by the way, never stopped. There is still today a lot of supernatural things, a lot of supernatural things, amazing things happening in Muslim countries right now uh, where, where hundreds of thousands of Muslims are actually converting to Christianity. You will never hear about that, um, but it's happening. So it's definitely confirmed by supernatural. So all of these things, under one point, the scriptures are inspired. And if the scriptures are inspired, we would we would expect to find certain things that would validate 
that this is a revelation from God. And we find that everywhere we look. See, this is what I'm saying. We're not just taking you know, a, a leap of blind faith. No, we have evidences. We have evidences. My faith just isn't out there. No, my faith is in something solid that I have evidences that undergird and uphold my faith. Um, Peter says it this way in 2 Peter 1.19. He says, so we have a prophetic word made more sure. And now he's talking about the Old Testament was made sure by the coming of Jesus Christ, which they actually saw. He says, we have seen and we have handled and we have, we have touched um, the, the, the living word of God being Jesus. Um, he says, to which you would do well to pay attention to is a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your heart. And then he says this, but know this first of all, no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke of God and so, or from God. And so Peter is basically saying the same thing Paul said. Paul said, all scripture is given by inspiration. God breathed. Peter's saying the same thing. Uh, it wasn't given by an act of human will, but people were moved on by the Holy Spirit and gave this revelation. So, um, so that's all just under being inspired. The second thing is, is that the Word of God is revealed in this book that we call the Bible. That this is, the Bible is the Word of God. The Word of God is the Bible. Um, this is an incredible compilation. This is 66 different books written over 1,500 years, 44 different authors. There's books of history, there's books of poetry, there's books of prophecy, and yet there's a consistent theme throughout the entire thing. I like to tell people, go to a library, pull out 66 books, and read them. Are you going to find a constant theme through all those books? No. And yet these are 66 books that you find in there Again, the revelation of the fall of man, the redemption of man, and who God is. It's incredible. This, reveal, this, is, this contains the revelation that God has for us. Um, Peter says it this way in 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 15. He says, "...and regarding the patience of the Lord of salvation, just as also your beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you." So here's Peter... Right? Peter's like the, the, the number one guy when we talk about the disciples. You know, there was Jesus, and then there was Jesus and Peter, and then there was Jesus, Peter, and John, and then there, you know, the circle went out in concentric circles of relationship. But, but Peter's the guy, you know, Peter's the one that said, you're the Christ, and I'm going to build my church on that revelation. And, and so, so Peter is now talking about Paul. And, and, and look what he says. He says, Paul as also in his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, but which the untaught and unstable distort, distort as they do the rest of their scriptures to their own destruction. So Peter is saying, hey, listen, you know, it's not just me. Paul is writing a lot of stuff also. Two-thirds of actually the, the New Testament are written by Paul. And um, and he says, and, and which in them are some things really hard to grasp, right? And when, when, you read the, when you read Paul, isn't some of his stuff like really kind of hard to understand? I mean, for one thing, the guy never used periods. It's like, oh my gosh, like end of thought, right? But it's like, eh, and then a comma, eh, and then a comma, eh, and then you're trying to like layer, layer, and unwrap this thing. It's like an onion. It's like the revelation is just like, Paul, you know, just give it a break, okay? We're, we're not like up there. We didn't go to heaven like you did, and, you know, we're not up there with you. You know, and, and this is what Peter's saying. Peter's saying, listen, he wrote a lot of things that are hard to understand, but then look what he says. As, the, as, as these other people, unstable and untaught, distort distort. I remember hearing a story of a guy who was cheating on his wife and trying to tell her that the scripture says as a wife you have to deal with it and put up with it because your job is to be faithful to me but God knows that one woman can't meet a man's needs that's why there's polygamy in the Old Testament so I can have multiple relationships. And he's expecting his wife to just kind of go along with that right? That's distorting the truth. But look at what he says. That's not even the, 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 the big point is when he says they distort it as they do the rest 
of the Scriptures. So what's Peter saying? Peter is saying that the things that Paul wrote to you are Scripture, the sacred writings. See, if I had if I had a hundred bucks, right? If I had a hundred bucks, and um, and I go over to Lionel and I say, Hey, Lionel, you know, here's ninety bucks, and then I go over to Carl and I say, Hey, Carl, here's ten bucks, and I say, Carl, you know, you're going to have to tithe on that because uh, just like Lionel's going to have to do with the rest of the money. What am I saying? It's all money, right? It's all money. It's a hundred bucks. There's ninety and there's ten, but it's all money. That's exactly what Peter's saying. Peter's saying, listen, there's all the scripture, and what Paul is writing is also scripture. It's the rest of the scripture. He got 90, the rest went to Carl. But it's all money. And so it's the same thing. All of, all of these books are scripture. Paul writes a bunch, that's also scripture. They just sort of as the rest of the scripture. So he's equating the, the, the validity of the New Testament writings as scriptural as the Old Testament sacred writings. And so we have all of these little proofs telling us that that yes, this is revealed in the scriptures, in the Bible. What else about the Bible would we find out? Well, we would find out that creation and bringing everything into existence would have something to do with what God speaks. And what do we find out? Because it's all his word. And so in his word, we find out that God brought everything into existence by his word. We go to Genesis chapter 1, and uh, and Genesis even chapter 2, and we find out that in Genesis chapter 1, eight times it says, and God said, and God said, and things were happening just because God said it. God did not have to go into a laboratory and start saying, hmm, let's see, I think I'll create a molten core. So let's see, do I get lava around? Oh, here's some lava. And then I'm going to create a granite crust. And then I'm going to create, you know, all these things. Water, that would be kind of cool. Make that baby steam, you know. You know, he didn't do that. He just simply spoke. And things happened according to the word of God. And so it's backed up again and again and again through scripture. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. Um, He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact representation of nature, and he upholds all things by the word of his power. Not the power of his word, but the word of his power. Uh, Again, speaking of the word, Romans chapter 4, verse 17, even God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. So how powerful is God's word? We see Jesus casting out demons, the Bible says, with a word. Not hocus pocus and, you know, we got to do all these crazy things that we watch these stupid movies on TV like The Exorcist and they're trying to work so hard and, you know, trying to get this demon out. Listen, demons simply obey the word, right? Just in Jesus' name come out. We don't have to sit there with holy water and crucifixes and everything else. It's just they, they, they fear that name of Jesus. They fear the spoken word of God. And so Jesus healed people, the Bible says, with just a word. Because he can call into being that which does not exist. Anything. Why why do you think it was a temptation for the devil to say, you can turn these rocks into bread? Because all he would have to say is bread and boom, there's a happy meal right there. I mean, that's just the way God is. It's just gonna gonna happen according to his word. And so we find out that all of creation and bringing everything into existence was through the power of God's word. What else do we find out? We find out that it's a light and it's a lamp. That the scriptures are referred to as a light and as a lamp. Um, it says here in Psalms 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And when I was just looking at that, just you know, this past week, I was looking at that, and I'm like, you know, I never saw that before. I wonder what the difference between a lamp and a light is. And then I found out that in the Hebrew, a lamp means a light to my to my feet, where a light means as bright as the noonday sun to my path. And I was like, holy smokes, is that awesome? Because the way of salvation is as clear as the noonday sun, and we should be on that trail. But we need a lamp to see where, where we're going on that thing. You know, sometimes we've done some night hikes and one of my hiking buddies, Keith, is here, and David is, Dave Solois is here, another one of my hiking buddies, and um, we've done some night hikes, and we got these headlamps on, 
and you're hiking at night, and they're shining. You know, when, when you hike at night, you're really not sightseeing because you can't see anything but what your light is illuminating, and it's illuminating what's right in front of you because there's rocks and there's roots and there's little stumps that will send you flying, and so it's it's a it's a it's a lamp right to my. But we know where the trail is going. Right? When we get onto a trail, when we're going to hike a mountain, we know the trail is as clear as day. We're on the trail. The trail is always going up. And so we're on the trail. We don't have to really pay a whole lot of attention. Sometimes they're not marked that well. But, you know, the trails are usually very, very obvious. But you got to look at what you're stepping over and around and through. And is it ice and is it not? And, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so he says, listen, the scriptures are like that for us. The scriptures are a lamp. They're a candle to let us see what we're walking through, to let us see what we're going through so that we don't stumble. But it's also a light. It is as clear as day that this is the path to walk on. This is the path of salvation. Jesus is the narrow gate. And boom, we're on that path of salvation. The psalmist in Psalms 19 says it this way. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. Jeff, you ever just sometimes you're so, you're so tired, you're beat down, you're worn out, you just need to have your soul restored. And he restores our soul through the word of God. He says the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. True wisdom comes from the scriptures. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable to gold, yes, much more than fine gold, sweeter than honey, sweeter than the drippings of the honeycomb. You know what made David, who wrote this, you know what made David such an awesome, incredible king? He was not a perfect man. We know that, right? Adultery, murder. I mean, kind of a couple big ones right there. Um, You know what made him the greatest king? Is that he agreed with God's word even when God's word condemned him. That's powerful. He humbled himself to always understanding that the word of God is righteous, it's true, it's just, and even when it condemns me, I still choose the word of God over my own defense or, or whatever else is there. And then he says this in verse 11. I love this part. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. Here's where the light to my path and the lamp to my, here's where it comes from. The scriptures are warning me. It's almost like, you know, there's a huge minefield out there called life. And there's a lot of ways we can get blown to smithereens. There's a lot of ways we can get derailed. There's a lot of ways we can ruin our lives. They're out there, but we don't detect them. And, and the word is like that big minesweeper. I don't know if it works that way, but it's kind of cool um, <laughs> to just do that. But it lets us know that there's things out there, right? Like, hey, if you don't handle finances right, you're going to derail your life. Hey, if you don't handle relationships right, you're going to wreck your life. Right? So, so it's, it's, it's warning us because it is a lamp, because it is a light. It's always out there working on us. Another thing we find out about it is that it's bread to the soul. It's, it satiates our souls. Nothing else ministers our soul. I mean, you can read intellectual things that will stimulate your mind, your knowledge, your imagination, your IQ, but the, the Word of God kind of bypasses that and goes into the soul. It feeds, it feeds the soul. Jesus said it this way. He answered and he said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Because bread is the most basic staple. And, 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 and people, you know, live a lot, of, in a lot of cultures, they live by, you know, on, on bread and eating bread. As a matter of fact, in a lot of cultures, they use bread instead of utensils. You know, it's a flat bread, but they'll grab the bread and they'll grab other things and eat it that way. Um, and, and um, you know, they don't have knives and forks and things like what we do. And so, um, but, but he's saying here that the word of God is like bread. And we get the image of manna, th- this bread that came down from heaven for 40 years and satiated and fed and nourished and kept healthy and alive the, the, the Israelites as they were wandering for 40 years through the wilderness. And Jesus said, I am that bread that comes down from heaven. And in Revelation, it talks about a hidden manna that we can eat, that we can be satiated on, that we can, we can have this manna. Um, uh, and, and basically, in Psalms 91.1, it says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. And that's that intimacy, that place where we, we run to our strong tower and we're 
fed by the bread of heaven. We're satiated. We're eating a hidden manna. Jesus said, I have food to eat that you guys don't even know about. Remember when he was at the woman in the well, John chapter 4, and they were like, Jesus, you have something to eat? And he goes, I have something to eat. You guys don't even, you're not even aware of what I'm eating. Because there's something between me and the Father. There's something about me and God that satiates me in the secret place. And I love that because in the Hebrew, that word secret place, or, or the shelter, some versions say, literally means a dark cloud. It means a hiding place, a place of protection. That no matter what happens in life, what happens, I can always run to this place where I'm satiated and upheld in presence of God through the Word of God. The other thing about the Scriptures, it's the sword to the fight. It's because we're in, we're in a fight. This isn't a, this isn't a playground. This is a battleground, and there's a fight that's going on around us. And Paul says this in Ephesians 6, 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. In order to beat off and fight off the, 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 the attacks of the enemy and the flaming missiles of the enemy, take the sword. This is the sword. This is the only offensive weapon. Everything else is the helmet and the breastplate and the shield and the, the belt and the, 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 the sheaths and on your feet. All it, but this is the offensive weapon. And what do we find when Jesus, who comes as a human being, and in his humanity, what do we find from Jesus in his humanity when he is being assaulted and attacked by the devil? Yeah. Right? If you're the son of God, you can turn these bread stones into bread. Right? And what do you, Satan, it is written. When you're the son of God, take yourself off in the temple and throw yourself at Satan. It is written. And I want you to know that's stinging. Because Jesus said he can't stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. It's like ice. He can't stand, you can't stand sometimes, especially wet ice, you can't, you know, you can't stand on it. And he can't stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. So this is the sword of the spirit. This is what the this is what Jesus used when he was in that fight. And if it was good enough for Jesus, it should be good enough for you and I that we should be able to speak the word of God right back at the enemy. Hey, Satan, you know what, Satan? Let me just say something right now. It is written. You might have knocked me down, but you're not going to knock me out. You might win a skirmish, but you don't win the war. Because it is written that we look at the end of the book, we know how this turns out. And it ain't too good for you, right? It's really good for us, but it's not too good for you. So it's a weapon of warfare. It's the truth that the enemy can't stand in. I want to, uh, I want to read what the Gideons, you know the Gideons are the ones that go around putting Bibles and, and prisons and in hotels and things like that. Um, and this is what they say. The Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It's the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, and the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Here, too, heaven is open, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good is its design, and the glory of God is its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. It is given to you in life, will be opened at the judgment, and will be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility, rewards the greatest labor, and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents." Man, that says it all right there, doesn't it? That is it. That is, that is it. That is the Word of God. This is the revelation. That's why the authority, our lives, in order to be successful as Christians, need to be founded and based on the authority of the Scriptures. I don't care what I feel. I don't care what I think. This is final authority in my life. And that's, what, that's when people start getting strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. You know, uh, uh, the Bible says you got to forgive, but you've got a real life situation, man. This is, this, is, this is skin in the game. This is where the rubber meets the road. That person hurt you. That person backstabbed you. That person assassinated your character. And the Bible is saying forgiven. What are you going to do? you got to go back to the authority. Of the, like David, even though, even though this word condemns me, I side with the word of God. I'm going to side with the word of God because it is his revelation. Listen. Over the centuries, many people have tried to destroy the Word of God. 
in the year 303, the Roman emperor Diocletian issued an edict to destroy Christians and their Bibles. The persecution that was launched by him was brutal. The gladiatorial games, Christians being thrown to the lions, Christians crucified, Christians dipped in tar and lit on fire. I mean, the persecution was brutal. Over a burnt Bible, Diocletian erected a monument which said, Extino nomine Christianorum, which means the Christian is extinguished. Twenty years later, Diocletian was dead and Constantine was the emperor of Rome. And Constantine became a follower of Christ and turned the entire Roman Empire towards Christianity. Just 20 years after, and he commissioned 40 copies of the Bible to be prepared and paid for by the government. They can fight all they want. They can mock all they want. But the word of the Lord stands forever. Jesus said, the word of God, not one jot or tittle will fail. Heaven and earth will fail before the word of God. In 1776, Voltaire, the French philosopher, announced, a hundred years, a hundred years from my day, this day, there will not be a Bible in the earth except that which is looked on by antique seekers. A hundred years later, Voltaire was dead, and his own home and his own printing press were being used to print and store Bibles by the Geneva Bible Society. It's amazing. A hundred years from the death of Voltaire's, uh, of Voltaire, his first edition works sold for 11 cents in Paris. But the British government paid the, paid the Tsar of Russia a half a million dollars for an ancient biblical manuscript. Isn't that amazing? These guys that stand on their big bully pulpits and say, this is all a bunch of malarkey, this is all a bunch of, I will wipe this out, there will never be another resemblance of this. And as time goes on, they are swept away by the sands of time. And the word of God is still the number one bestseller in the world. In every language, in every tribe, in every tongue, in every dialect, the number one bestseller of the world. It is the word of God. It contains the revelation of God and the hope of our salvation. Amen. I want, I want to just launch you off like in a 2019 saying, you know what, if we're going to be men and women of God, then we have to be men and women of the scriptures. We have to be men and women of the word of God. We have to dig into it deep. We have to study it. We have to memorize it. We have to meditate it. We have to get it into our soul. We have to get it into our minds. Father, we are so thankful that you being a God of love has a, an inert desire to communicate because love has to be expressed. Love has to be communicated. And so you communicated through many ways, through the prophets and through the fathers and the patriarchs down through the years, but especially through your son Jesus Christ. And then through his followers who, who were moved upon you to record these manuscripts, to begin to write these manuscripts. And then down through the years, Lord, the faithful men and women and the scribes that, that faithfully recorded all of these manuscripts. Thank you, Lord, that what we have in our homes, what we have in our possession, what we may have on our, our laptops or our iPads, that it's the faithful word of God. That we're not just believing some blind myth written by people years ago. We're believing something that is valid and active and there's proofs and there's evidences. We are standing on something solid. Something that is so solid that Peter walked on water because you said one word, come. And Peter believed that word and walked on a liquid like it was a solid. We are standing on something immovable, unshakable, the living, abiding Word of God. And we're so thankful that that Word has precious promises by which we're saved and our salvation is secure and safe because we believe that heaven and earth will pass away, but your promise of salvation to us will never, never, never end. Thank you for that great love that reveals who you are, an awesome, awesome, loving, merciful, forgiving God. Help us to always run into your arms. 
Help us to always love your presence as we sang about this morning and cherish that intimate place with you because you are our strong and mighty tower. When trouble hits, we run right to you. Thank, thank you, Lord, for the lamp. Thank you for the light of your scriptures. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen and amen and amen. Hey, God bless you. Happy New Year to all of you. I pray 2019 is extra special and awesome, and then it's a God year for all of you. God bless you. Enjoy our cafe, and we'll see you next week. If you need prayer this morning, there are people up here that will gladly pray with you and for you.